This panel was recorded Friday, March 19, 2021, during the 15th Annual Public Administration Research Conference hosted by the Center for Public and Nonprofit Management at UCF. The panel is titled, Governance and Problem Solving, Relationships and Transparency Between Actors, Stakeholders, and Partners. It is moderated by Dr. Greg Buckingham of UCF. Welcome to all of you uh, to the PARC conference and in particular uh, to this uh, panel session, which is about uh, governance and problem solving and the relationships and transparency between actors, stakeholders, and partners. Uh, I think this uh, theme of this panel fits perfectly with the conference uh, theme of uh, justice and inclusion and public purpose and value. And so uh, I look forward to what our panelists have to say. Um, what I'd like to suggest is, and by the way, I'm a lecturer at UCF uh, in, uh, in Orlando, uh, and I've been teaching about five years uh, uh, in that capacity. Um, what I would like to uh, suggest is that you're free to post a question to the chat room anytime and we'll pick those up. Uh, each panelist will talk. First, we're gonna introduce ourselves and then we'll go in reverse order and each panelist will uh, give their talk. We'll answer a question or two after each panelist. And then at the end, we'll take most of the questions and hopefully have a discussion. And so I look forward to uh, everyone's discussion also. Um, we have three panelists, one uh, here from Orlando, uh, Mr. Uh, Terry Henley, one from Italy, uh, Kiera Salati, and one from Nigeria, Dr. Salisu. And Dr. Salisu will hopefully be here uh, in just a bit. So um, I suggest you kind of keep your view on the speaker view. Um, and um, and uh, again, feel free uh, to make it as an interactive uh, session as possible. Uh, we are recording this, I want to say that, uh, so that we'll have it for a record uh, later on. So uh, we'll start with introductions, and we will go first to uh, Terry Henley. Hey, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Greg, for the introduction. My name is Terry Henley, and I have about 10 years of experience in government, particularly at the local level, working in budget departments. I, uh, I'm in my second year of a PhD program at UCF. My focus of study is on financial sustainability. And the project I'll be discussing today is about community development districts. And it addresses the park theme of public purpose. The project is also sponsored by the Foundation for Community Association Research. Thank you. Okay. Uh, welcome to Dr. Salisu. We'll get to you in one second. Uh, Kiera, would you introduce yourself? Uh, yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Kiera Salati, and I'm a PhD student in Global Studies, Justice, Rights, and Politics at the University of Macerata in Italy. Um, having a legal background, I got my five years master's degree in uh, comparative European and transnational law from the University of Trento, still in Italy. And my research fields uh, concerns uh, mainly the topic of the commons, uh, civic participation on the local level and the law of cities. And um, today I'm going to present you the innovative model of uh, shared administration of the commons. And um, this is a novelty of the that happened in, it, in Italy about uh, six years ago. So I would like to introduce you to that. Okay, so um, as you can see today, my presentation is about the Italian model of shared administration. We are gonna deepen into how active citizens are, are collaborating with state institutions for taking care of the commons. So, the structure of the presentation is the following one. So we will start with a brief introduction and then I will um, introduce you to the model of shared administration. We will then look at some uh, examples of uh, packs of collaboration among uh, uh, cit active citizens and public administrations. Then we will delve into some findings from the model and eventually some future perspectives and open questions. 
Uh, at first, I would like to start with a question for you. Uh, did it ever happen to you to um, come up with an idea that would benefit not only um, your community, uh, but also all the, the whole people around you? An idea maybe of taking care of a commons. Uh, if it never happened to you, don't worry, because there are already some hundreds of thousands of people that uh, uh, are started already in thinking in this way and uh, having a local impact. The keywords of today are the following one, taking care of the commons through a collaboration between active citizens and public institutions for the general interest of the community. Um, I decided to uh, present the, my research and uh, the model of shared administration because uh, I, th I see it is an innovative solution in the public administration scenario. And uh, it is basically a new alliance occurring between the, the public and the private actors that started in Italy a few years ago. Um, shared administration is an answer to which problem? The problem that we saw is the need for a recognition of all those active citizens that started taking initiative for the general interest and their need for being recognized within a juridical framework, which is what the model of shared administration is providing for. And as a consequence of that, we see that basically there is a third actor beyond the, the state and the market that is emerging, which is the community. The methods used, uh, just um, a, brief mention, a brief mention, is uh, having a legal background, I mainly used legal, legal sources, so constitutional law and administrative law, and more in general public law sources, and uh, combined with the empirical evidence coming from the facts of collaboration, which is a new public law tool that I will uh, explain to you. Um, so, shared administration, the novelty of the Italian model. Everything started in 2001 in Italy with the constitutional reform that introduced the principle of horizontal subsidiarity at Article 118 providing for this new model of collaboration and facilitation from public administration to uh, citizens. In 2007 and 8, we had this Rodota Commission appointed by the Minister of Justice that came up with the definition of beni comuni, which are the commons or common goods. And um, lately in 2014, there was this uh, truly innovative uh, um, regulation that was introduced in the municipality of Bologna for the very first time called the regulation for the shared administration of the common goods and lately just a few months ago in July 2020 the constitutional court of Italy for the very first time recognized this model the model of shared administration as a, um, a model of collaboration between uh, active citizens and um, public institutions based on the principle of solidarity as an alternative to the principle of competition. So um, as you can see here, the hierarchy of sources is um, this pyramid. From uh, the ground, we have those packs of collaboration occurring informal that are informal agreements occurring between active citizens and public administration. So signed by those two parts. Then we have uh, mm, uh, the municipal regulation for shared administration, which is the uh, regulation that allows those pacts of collaboration to be uh, signed. And uh, the regulation is uh, in turn um, allowed thanks to the uh, principle of horizontal subsidiarity of the Italian constitution. Um, so what does the principle of horizontal subsidiarity mean? From the text, as we can read, it says in our constitution that the state, regions, metropolitan cities, provinces and municipalities shall promote, so it's an obligation, to the autonomous initiatives of citizens considered both as individuals and as members of associations relating to activities of the general interest on the basis of the principle of subsidiarity. But what is this general interest? 
the literature as well as the practice in years starting from 2001 when the reform was uh, passed of the constitution started connecting the general interest with the commons on the ground level and so here it comes the law um, the, the legal definition given by the commission on the commons the commons so that are those goods that express a functional benefit to the exercise of fundamental rights as well as to the autonomous development of the individuals so individuals acting through the commons taking care of the commons for the general interest of the community uh, there has been a impressive progress since uh, 2014 with the introduction of the very first regulation until nowadays um, 236 municipalities around the italy have adopted the same regulation and the practical implementation of this regulation occurred through the signing of thousands of packs of collaboration between individuals and the public administration at the local level and as a consequence of that, there has been hundreds of thousands of people, the one that I was mentioning at the beginning with my question, that have been empowered by this new model around the country and having an impact on their communities. But how does this model work? So everything starts with a spontaneous activation of individuals that are willing to contribute to the general interest of their community through an action of care for a commons. But what are the commons? they could be defined as tangible intangible or digital some examples are parks streets squares schools and buildings as well as culture education sport historical memory as well as data platforms and websites as digital commons so spontaneous activation of individuals in parallel to that spontaneous activation there is an obligation on the public institutions to facilitate all those individuals in their action of care for a commons thanks to the principle of horizontal subsidiarity that i was mentioning and the match among the two parts comes through a co-design and co-decision process between the two parts it is basically a new form of dialogue between individuals and the public administration that is occurring through a collaborative and not competitive legal tool that is called Pact of Collaboration, as I was mentioning. Pact of Collaboration, what is it? It is basically a written agreement that contains tasks of the two parts, responsibilities, objectives, resources brought in by the two parts, etc. So all what the two parts decides together for this action of care for a commons. And thanks to the, all this very basic procedure, there is this new form of uh, um, collaboration that is spreading more and more uh, around uh, Italy since 2014. And uh, how does the practice look like? So here on the left, you can see the regulation. And this is the very first one adopted in, uh, uh, in Bologna. I can uh, briefly show you. Can you see my PDF? Not, not yet. Okay, not yet. Uh, right, I see the uh, uh, I see the PowerPoint slide at okay. the moment. Okay, great. You might have to stop sharing the PowerPoint to share the PDF. Mm. Okay. Now you you still see the PDF the the presentation. Yes. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. on, like this. Um, so you can see here on the left, the regulation, which is basically a municipal regulation and uh, on the shared administration among the two parts. And uh, you see the general disposition with the definitions of uh, all those actions of cares, shared administration, what do we mean for active citizens, the public administration and so on. And then um, general procedural rules, uh, uh, the kind of um, interventions that you can uh, implement, etc. And uh, on the right, uh, you see a, an example of a pact of collaboration. So it's again a very easy document with the, the mentioning at the beginning of the two parts the municipality, 
so the public administration and the, um, the, uh, the signatories on the civil um, active citizen side. And then you introduce with all the objectives, the goals of the collaboration, the different responsibilities, the actions of care on the practical level, what do they mean, uh, insurances, etc. Um, so, um, as you can see, the packs of collaboration is a place where to experiment. Which are the basic features? It is a, um, a tool based on mutual trust. Each one of the signatories take a part of responsibility. It can involve also informal groups of people and not only organized group of people. So it's based on the autonomy of civil society as well as individuals. It's not about maintenance, this pact of collaboration, but it's about care. And we focus on that because when we talk about maintenance, we refer to the role of public administration in maintaining uh, public goods in the public, according to the public interest. Here we are in the field of care. So individuals caring for the commons. It also creates a relation between people and it gives dignity to volunteers that are recognized through this uh, juridical framework. It can solve conflicts and problems of general interest, and it is an additional instrument to other juridical tools. No, it doesn't mean to uh, substitute them, but just to complement what's already existing. And last but not least, it is not a withdrawal of the public in favor of the private, but it is basically a new alliance occurring. So who can sign a pact of collaboration? On the public side, we have the public administration, and on the private side, we have the so-called active citizens. They could be individuals, a single person, an informal group or associated citizens, as well as organizations, companies, associations, and institutions. Um, on which field the actions of care can be uh, organized on uh, public gardens, streets, city squares, schools, and as well as uh, cultural centers, library, etc., as well as sports, social inclusion, education, and recreation activities. And most important, what kind is the what, what of what kind is the support from public administrations? Public administration. In the majority of cases promote uh, the initiatives through communication, networking, etc., needed materials, uh, tools, administrative help, insurances, fiscal benefits, bureaucratic simplification, and free use of spaces. Here, um, I wanted to collect some examples of case studies, also through some photos. And um, I don't know how much time I have left. Uh, if you... Okay. Um, yes, you have about three minutes. Okay, maybe I will go a bit fast here so that if you have questions, uh, I can answer them later. Okay. Uh, so, so just some examples of uh, this is in Caserta, is a pact of, or all those cases are about uh, pacts of collaboration that have been signed for solving specific problems, uh, so, uh, problems at the local level. This is a community management of the public park and uh, with a combined gem production from the park oranges and the income of that is uh, uh, given back to the uh, local for the de local development uh, of the of the area this is a, in, in milan on the right you see a private good that has been uh, co-managed through a pact of collaboration and then here in Verona, you see a, a platform as a digital commons on the down left, a school as a commons in a uh, depopulated uh, rural areas in the mountain. And then on the right, you see a pact of collaboration signed for taking care of walking trails. And these uh, had co positive consequences on uh, positive externalities as a consequence on local tourism and local development. Uh, etc. And uh, pacts of collaboration have been signed also during the pandemic. 
And on the right, for example, you see uh, this is the case of Cesena, a city that decided to reorganize all the public spaces in the city, around 100 gardens, with packs of collaboration that would uh, allow um, uh, a better organization of the parks. And here again, other examples that uh, I will just go a bit further. So uh, reaching the conclusions, which are the findings from this model? It is at first a very new idea for public administration that is empowering people bottom up, complementing the institutional top down. It is uh, creating also a new model of democracy because uh, scholars start talking about contributory democracy or local democracy in a, as a complementary to the traditional representative, participatory, deliberative and direct democracy. It can work everywhere, not only in big cities, but also in small villages, as the Italian case is proving. It uh, also has an impact on local economies, and uh, it is not a project, but it is a juridical framework. So um, to conclude, future perspectives and open questions. Uh, the number one question is, of course, the scalability to other EU countries. Uh, not only European Union countries, but also <laughs> we can even open it worldwide the limits of this new model and uh, the legislative development of the commons and uh, lastly the increasing complexity of packs of collaboration dealing not only with the uh, easier uh, commons like public parks and gardens but also with the intangible and digital commons here uh, i concluded my presentation i leave you some references here and um, Thank you very much. And of course, if you want to stay in touch here, if you can see, there is my email. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you, Kara. Uh, is there a, a question from the uh, audience? I don't see any in the chat. OK. Um, I would just like to ask one quick question. These are agreements between individuals and the municipalities or the, uh, the local authority <clears throat> are we have nonprofit uh, organizations uh, involved here in the US and I'm sure you do too are they involved in this in some way yes yes of course they are and uh, of course they are taking they they are being signed signing packs of collaboration with nonprofit organization but the additional um, value of this model, that uh, as of now um, eh, it was missing, it is the inclusion of individuals and informal groups. So all these uh, huge numbers of um, single person or uh, informal and not recognized group, as of now were not being recognized anyhow, they were simply volunteers. But the additional value of this model is that it's truly um, allowing a, a formal and juridical recognition also of all of those uh, kind of contributions. To go back, um, uh, Sarah had a, had a comment, not necessarily a question, on a uh, presentation. And so I would like to uh, uh, come back to her and have her make her comment while we have this break. Oh yeah, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I am actually uh, Italian, so I have the the background, you know, of how uh, public administration works in Italy. But uh, um, but I'm also doing my PhD in the US, so I have also knowledge on how things work in here. And my comment was uh, pretty much related to um, uh, to the study of Chiara uh, regarding how uh, you know like um, states uh, and countries look look like they're going uh, more and more towards like an let's say a decentralized approach of public administration and I'm a comparativist and I uh, do research on emergency management so I can see how you know the emergency management uh, for instance here in the US uh, gives a lot um, in terms of leadership and you know management um, to the to the uh, to the local so to the counties to the states and to the um, to the cities and 
And how is this, you know, also occurring, uh, for instance, in Italy? So this decentralization is also occurring in Italy, where regions, uh, in our case, that's our um, administrative uh, division, have this kind of like leadership role when it comes to emergency management. So it's interesting to see the same kind of like patterns uh, motivated by different reasons. Of course, in the US, we have like a broad, um, uh, you know, like a broad territory. So it's needed uh, to kind of like better administrate. Uh, but in Italy, you know, we have different kind of like motives behind. Uh, but the result is that, you know, like locals are having more and more leadership role uh, than before. And not only uh, like another thing I am I'm noticing is the importance given to the communities. So what Chiara was discussing and, you know, like about, you know, the role of citizens, it's pretty much what we also see here in the US within the emergency management, again, which is my expertise, when it comes to like the certs and certs, you know, that comes to play in terms of disaster. So uh, that was my comment. And I'm, you know, I'm glad to discuss with Chiara for her. So yeah, I'm, I saw that the speaker came back. So I leave the floor to him. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you would stop sharing, Chiara, we'll move yeah. on to uh, Terry uh, Henley. And uh, uh, and hear his talk. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, yes, again, my name is Terry Henley, and today I'll be discussing uh, CDDs, or Florida Community Development Districts, their financial condition, trends uh, since they started in the 1980s, and in particular, HOA perceptions as homeowner associations, and the project is sponsored by the Foundation for Community Association Research. So the objectives for the presentation today include the, uh, the background of CDDs, how they got started uh, as a particular type of special district, and then the problem or the phenomenon that's being studied. Then I'll, I'll get into the theoretical framework of some theories that inform uh, the proliferation of CDDs and explain the problem of that there's little discussion or research on CDDs. I'll propose a study and I have some research questions and uh, through my methodology, which is qualitative, and I'll discuss some preliminary results that I've received from semi-structured interviews. And then I'll get into a discussion of limitations, takeaways and future uh, work. So community development districts, they started uh, in 1980 when the Florida statute authorized them. And what, what they are is a, a developer will petition to a local government uh, that they want to develop some land. And it can be residential development or commercial development of unused land. So in exchange, when the private sector petitions to the public sector, in exchange, the public sector gives the private sector public sector powers. So essentially, the private sector will form uh, its own uh, autonomous local government, and it's called a special district. There's, there's any one types in Florida, and this is just one of them, but it's the, the uh, CDDs are the most. Uh, so they have the power when to uh, get the capital to develop the land. They have the power to uh, tax future property owners, and in exchange, they, they can pay down the uh, bond debt that they used as the capital uh, to do the development. And this debt is also uh, tax exempt. In Florida, there uh, are approximately 412 cities and 67 counties. Now there's 732 active CDDs. So this represents almost double the size of local governments. And this is a significant uh, proliferation. And interestingly, many of these CDDs, uh, after gathering unpublished data from the governor's office, uh, more than 230 of them since about uh, 1999 have received a condition of financial emergency. And what an FE or financial emergency means is that uh, you have difficulties uh, meeting your current financial obligations. Essentially, you can't or you can't pay the bills or you had issues paying bills because uh, not enough resources. 
So the, the phenomenon is that there's really little attention on these CDDs, despite that they're, uh, or despite that they're almost double the size of local governments. Uh, and they also take on a lot of the government powers. Uh, local governments that once used to provide services, now the CDDs are doing it. Uh, now, Florida Statute 190, it says that CDDs are not to outlive their usefulness and they are not to duplicate general uh, purpose local governments. A general purpose local government would be a city or a county. Now, this relates back to the park theme for today, which is public purpose. And prior study by Edgar in, in 2012 found that uh, 56 of, of the CDDs in the state had were eligible to be dissolved, meaning they already met their special purpose of developing land. Uh, so why aren't they dissolved? Uh, then I also mentioned the financial emergency history where many of them uh, had these FE conditions. And this occurred at the time, a lot of them occurred at the time of the 2008 housing bubble crash. The literature also demonstrated that uh, special districts specifically had uh, tendencies to be titled as shadow governments because of low public awareness or in, in dem uh, undemocratic attributes. But it's important to also discuss the strengths of CDDs. Now, in, in the state of Florida, they were able to grow uh, because uh, when cash-strapped cities in the 1980s, 90s, and, and still uh, didn't uh, have the capital or resources to provide infrastructure and new development to all the influx of uh, new population coming down, CDDs were, an eight, were uh, create a financing mechanism to do that, which didn't require a lot of accountability on the city governments and didn't require a financial investment, just give authorization to let the CDD be developed. Now, the research on qualitatively on CDDs, uh, it has done semi-structured interviews uh, on CDD administrator perceptions of CDDs or the perceptions of local governments on CDDs, but not on homeowners and their perceptions. So that's what this, this will address. Uh, this, this chart simply shows uh, the proliferation uh, graphically and you'll see between 99 and 2007, uh, right before the housing bubble, they, uh, there, there were about 42 CDDs average uh, created per year during this time frame, And then it drops drastically until about 2000, 15, 16, it starts to pick up. The last two years in 2018 and 2019, uh, almost averaged the same number of CDDs being created annually as before the Great Recession in 2007. And now with the new COVID-19, uh, we'll see what happens because that recession is quite, uh, this recession that we're in right now is a little bit different because it was uh, artifa uh, artificially stimulated, whereas the other one was due to uh, speculative housing uh, investments and the housing bubble in general. The theories that inform the uh, proliferation of CDDs, uh, there's two of them. The one on the left is exchange theory, and this is the macro view. Uh, the one on the right is the benefits principle, and it's the micro view. So on the left, if you're looking at exchange theory, I talked about, and both theories, by the way, have to do with cost benefits between parties. The one on the left is the cost benefits between governments and the developer. The one on the right is between individuals buying property in the CDD and uh, the CDD. So on the left, I discussed the, uh, how the developers petition to, get, to uh, get development in exchange. The local governments give them that, those powers and then the local governments, once the development occurs, which they didn't really have to pay for, the local governments, in essence, their property tax base will increase as spillover benefits. So they can get uh, that property tax money to help their existing constituents in providing services. 
the arrangements is, is mutually beneficial, but the conditions have to be right. And there's only a few city or a few states that have CDDs, California and Florida. And in Florida, it was a regressive tax system. Uh, we don't have state income tax. We had high population growth. We needed to accommodate a uh, large uh, influx of people coming in. And also cash strapped cities with, with uh, state and federal appropriations being diminished. Cities had to be creative. On the right, uh, the assumption or is that the, prop, the prospective property buyer, an individual who's gonna buy a property in a CDD, well, was gonna pay more taxes, but in exchange for the additional taxes, they get a special benefit. And that's gonna be common facilities uh, and uh, the new development, that, the perks that come with it, maybe special services and direct, more direct services just for them. So being that is the consent, then it's agreeable because it's mutually beneficial. Then the subsequent issues include uh, the state oversight has been noticed as being issues, uh, a diffusion of responsibility or the bystander effect, which agency is really responsible for overseeing these CDDs? There's many, or it should it be the city and counties. Uh, buyers are, were found to be unaware that they were in a CDD with the first tax bill coming in the first year being like, what is this? I, I didn't know. Uh, also board composition. The, the first 10 years of development of developing a property, the developers can appoint their own uh, board members to a board like a city council. And then they, de they decide what the, what the tax rate is gonna be for the residents. So this is essentially a taxation without representation. So I look at that in this study, that's an issue here. And also overlap in government services. Uh, so the purpose of the study was to see uh, what do community members think about this growth phenomenon and its impact, uh, especially with CDDs and financial emergency and uh, I wanted to look at CDs also in Central Florida. So I asked them, there's four sub research questions, uh, research areas, and that includes awareness of the CDD governance and its existence, whether there's overlap and efficiency and effectiveness, which other studies have looked at from administrators point of view, but this is from HOA point of view. Uh, also awareness of the financial condition of being the CD having a financial emergency, are people aware? And the economic impact on them. The research design is a phenom uh, study uh, with six broad questions and some follow-ups. My target is six to nine home homeowners that are on HOA boards, homeowner associations that are within CDDs. So it's a layer within a layer. Um, and the project secured IRB approval. And in my recruitment, I sent an explanation of research uh, to per, uh, prospective participants. Uh, and these are the results so far from the study. Uh, I was able to do uh, five semi-structured interviews. Uh, one of them was a beta because uh, uh, that person was not an active HOA board member. And so far I found that the uh, preliminary results of the interviews does not vary far from speculation or criticisms of, of uh, special districts or in some CDDs. Uh, most residents, they, they were unaware of financial condition that the CDD was, had an FEE history. Uh, the communication between CDDs and HOAs were weak uh, or they, one participant said they do the bare statutory minimum. We hear from them once a year during the budget and that's it. We, uh, also information about development uh, in the district is not relayed to residents. Uh, presumably once the development is done, there's no need for the CDD, CDD anymore once they're done building, but these CDDs persist or have uh, perpetuality as noted by Eager in 2012. Uh, there's the uh, I looked at the economy and the impact of COVID has not been significant uh, on many of these. And it probably has to do with some of them not because they haven't lost their jobs or because they're retired and not, uh, it hasn't impacted them. Uh, the CDD effectiveness and efficiency was, was mixed. 
and which entity they prefer to provide a service. And also the, the CDD existence. It was the consensus so far that the CDD was necessary to, to start the development. Otherwise these uh, participants wouldn't have bought property, but the benefits of the CDD wane over time where it may not be necessary anymore and they question that. I also looked at some uh, in the data, I looked at the democratic tendencies. And it doesn't seem to be an issue here because 723 of the 732 active CDDs uh, had democratically elected boards. Um, and also, uh, interestingly, there were members, participants that I interviewed who, who were HOA board members, that was the target, who also happened to serve on the CDD, which implications of that and how uh, prevalent that is will be fascinating to study further. So the limitations of my study, uh, it's a purposive sampling. I wanted CDDs with uh, FE, uh, financial emergency histories and HOAs within them. Uh, the, I need a, at least one or two more, more uh, interviews. However, I have, a, I have a timeline to finish this project by uh, this summer. So that will be challenging. And there's also bias in selection, but I'm bracketing so I, I can address this concern. And uh, lastly, the generalizability. It may not be generalizable to California because they have different laws, and it may not be generalizable to all special districts. So the biggest takeaway, and this is the last slide, the, the biggest takeaway from this study is that there only time will tell what the impact of COVID is going to be on CDD's financial condition and then its impact on residents. And uh, there needs to be a, a database that has HOAs and CDDs linked. That currently doesn't exist. And so uh, I should finish this summer and I'd like to incorporate any feedback from uh, this panel. And I appreciate your time and here are some prime references for the study. Thank you. All right, uh, very nice. Uh, any questions from uh, those uh, on the Zoom? I don't see any currently. Okay. I, Terry, I'd like to ask you for the, uh, for the six that you interviewed or for the larger population, can you characterize these at all in terms of uh, size or uh, are they all over the state, uh, urban, rural, any kind of characterization that you can give to these? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the target was to have, uh, there was two, First, I made a priority list of 73 CDDs out of the 732. And the priorities were based on most recent financial emergency, so that when I interview folks, they, uh, it's, it's fairly recent. And then the second, then I made a second and third list based on that 73. And it was uh, being in Central Florida because I'm uh, more familiar with it. And second, Having a financial emergency in the last three years, as well as during the Great Recession. So having a financial emergency condition in both recessions. So with that, I had a total of 30. Now out of the 30 CDDs, uh, it's very difficult to find HOAs within them. There's 48,000 HOAs in the state and it's, they're not linked to CDDs. The ones that I found, uh, they a couple were in the Central Florida region, uh, one in South Florida, and the administrative burden of finding uh, interview is it's tremendous because you have to do a public records request to the CDD, and then they send you to a property management company, and then the property management company will send your email to the HOA board. It, I think I've spent more time trying to find participants than, <laughs> than writing. <laughs> okay. 
I understand. Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much. That's an interesting study. Uh, all right. If you would stop sharing, we will uh, move to our third uh, panelist, uh, uh, Dr. Salisu. Thank you. Uh, I am here with my, my name is Musa Idris from the Department of Public Administration, Ahmadu Bello University, Zaria, Nigeria. Uh, we have a joint paper with uh, Dr. Um, Shehu um, Salisu Jafaru, and um, the title of the paper is an effect of corruption on public service delivery in Nigeria. Okay, thank, thank you. The no title problem. of our presentation is Corruption and Public Service Delivery in Nigeria. As we are all aware, states without exception owe a lot of obligations to the citizens, as much as the citizens owe certain duties to the state. This relationship between the state and the citizens has been espoused by the theory of social contract. However, we all know that it is true governance that the will of the state is expressed, articulated, and realized. The public service, as we all know, is the machinery of government for formulating and implementing policies and programs for effective service delivery. Prominent among these services is the maintenance of law and order and the protection of lives and property, as well as the provision of health, education, and uh, water supply. The federal government of Nigeria, in pursuance of this, established, established the Savicon Charter in 2003 to promote efficient and effective service delivery we're, we're breaking up. The 2020 also focused. Yeah, Thank you. that is. Can you hear me now? Is this still breaking? You broke up a little, but I can hear you now. Okay. Thank you. The economic recovery and growth plan of the federal government, 2017 to 2020, also focused on anti-corruption as well as delivery of health and educational services, among others. The, as we all know that corruption is a global phenomenon. We apologize for the break in transmission. That's okay. Can you we, hear us now? We can hear you very well now, yes. Oh, thank you very much. The research question worth asking is that, is there any significant relationship between corruption and delivery of health and education, health, water supply, as well as educational services in Nigeria? That is the research question. The objective, the major objective of this paper is to examine the significance of the relationship between corruption and the delivery of health and medical services access to water supply and quality education. And um, the hypothesis, the study hypothesized that there is no significant relationship between corruption and delivery of health and medical services in Nigeria. Two, there is no significant relationship between corruption and access to public water supply in Nigeria and uh, three, there is no significant relationship between corruption and delivery of educational services in Nigeria. We, the literature reviewed shows that there are two major perspectives in trying to conceptualize corruption. That is the moralist view and the functionalist view. From the moralist point of view, corruption is an immoral act because it deviates from the norms of the society and it is an aberration in the public service. 
the functionalists are of the view that corruption can serve, can be beneficial, particularly when people are under pressure, they lobby to get services from public servants. But the, the literature equally points out that this can be short-lived. But corruption can better be appreciated from looking at the indicators. And this can be in the form of uh, bribery, in the form of favoritism, in the form of uh, nepotism, in the form of embezzlement uh, of monies meant for public uh, work programs. And uh, when we look, look at the theoretical framework, we intend to use the public choice theory, otherwise known as social choice theory or the economic of uh, politics. This theory has its roots in economics and uses the language of economics using an, an individual. The theory uh, has uh, originally associated with Duncan Black and George Stigler, and uh, now has uh, James Buchanan as the major proponent. Others are Williams, Niskanem to mention a few. The theory is of the view that the pursuit of self-interest yield desired results in the marketplace. And that bureaucrats, public servants as individuals are utility maximizers. And that unlike the view of Max Weber, who says bureaucrats should be selfless and benevolent servants of the state, this theory is saying that just like any other individual, public servants also pursue self-interest in the political marketplace. But why the pursuit of self-interest in, in, in the economic marketplace may yield desired results, the pursuit of that same self-interest in the political marketplace can be counterproductive. The major source of data, we go to the methodology, the source of data is mainly from Transparency International for data on uh, corruption using the CIP Corruption Perceptions Index. And um, we have the CIP there. The CIP measures the level of uh, transparency. And uh, the next column after that is that of corruption. You can see from the data analysis from that table for the years 2000 to 2019, the average level of corruption in Nigeria is estimated at 77.8%. Uh, this, this is contrary. The okay, data on the public service delivery, that is the delivery of health and medical services, delivery uh, of uh, quality education, and access to uh, water is assessed from Mo Ibrahim Foundation. The Mo Ibrahim Foundation is the most Afrocentric uh, the foundation, non-governmental organization concerned with promoting governance and uh, providing free data for research. It has provided the quality, uh, it has provided the percentage of health service delivery from 2000 to 2019. And uh, the average uh, uh, rate of public service delivery for this is given as 53.98. The same is for access to water supply, which is as low as 34%. Uh, and uh, for the provision of quality education, it is estimated at 44.22. When you look at the level of corruption in Nigeria, it is, um, has, it has no regular pattern and it varies from uh, the lowest of uh, about uh, 73 to the highest of uh, 90% in uh, 2001. In our attempt to examine the significance of the relationship between our IV and the DVs, we use a core, a spare mass correlation coefficient to test our hypothesis. The, the test of hypothesis indicates that corruption has a significant negative effect 
on the delivery of health and medical services with uh, ARU value of minus uh, 0.8 uh, which is very high, but very negative uh, as, as such, there is a significant negative relationship between corruption and, and uh, delivery of health and medical services. It means as corruption increases, the level of health service delivery nosedives goes down. And the same is with access to water supply, why the, the p-value is 0 0.007, that is at 95 level of significance, the, the R value is put at minus 0.5, Seven nine, which also indicates there is a significant relationship between the level of corruption in Nigeria and access to water supply. The high incidence of corruption can it can be said to be one of the potent factors responsible for poor water supply in Nigeria. However, the case the the study discovered that the case is different for provision of quality education in Nigeria. The, yeah, as the research indicates that the relationship between corruption and provision of quality education is not significant. So the study, the, the, the study concludes that the level of corruption in Nigeria has been very high average of 77.8, the level of water supply has been very poor, and that the high incidence of corruption has negatively affected delivery of health and medical services, as well as access to water supply. However, the same cannot be said of the provision of quality education. Then uh, we, the, the, this relationship can be explained by the fact that there are monopolies in the provision of health and medical services, as well as provision of, uh, as well as provision of water supply in Nigeria. And so with these monopolies, the incidence of corruption has, has affected these two areas more than the provision of quality education where we have more players. In view of this, the study recommends that a greater participation, the liberalization of the, the commercialization of these services by government will go a long way in reducing patronage by public servants, thereby improving the quality of these services delivery. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Uh, very good. I wonder, uh, uh, we have a question in the chat, uh, and that yes. is, uh, what did you use as indicators of corruption? Uh, in other words, how did you measure that variable? The, the, you know, Transparency International uses the Corruption Perceptions Index. And so since the study had used secondary data, it is sourced from this. And when you look at the uh, view of Transparency International on corruption, it's simply, it's mainly concerned with the payment of bribes. Okay. So this is the major indicator used in this study. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, yes. <clears throat> other questions? Yes. Uh, Greg, uh, Dan Stevens here. Uh, yes. If I could actually follow up that same question. Uh, thank you, first of all, for your presentation. Uh, my thank uh, you. Uh, my uh, question pertain, pertaining to the indicators of corruption, um, yes. I followed up that same question with, uh, might those indicators be skewed? You know, like if, if if corruption is measured, let's say, by arrests, you know, or something to that effect, 
might those people that are in charge actually have, uh, you know, influence. And so that might actually skew the level of corruption. Yeah. And, and, and keep in mind, I'm not doubting, you know, um, your, your claims. I'm just wondering actually your methodology. And I'm, I guess I'm not as familiar with the index to which you referred. The, 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 other, the other observation is noted. The, 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 the paper is a work in progress. And uh, instead of relying on bribe payments alone, we'll look for other indicators. Thank you for your contribution. Sure. But the information on the dependent variables, uh, the, inf the data is from the Mo Ibrahim Foundation of, uh, for African Governance. It is an uh, Afrocentric non-governmental organization concerned with improving the quality of governance in Africa, rewarding outstanding um, uh, president, national leaders and providing free information for res uh, researchers. It has its own uh, indicators and uh, about, uh, four, categ about four, four categories, 17 subcategories and over 100 indicators. So among them is this, uh, the, 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 the issue of water supply, provision of medical and health services, as well as um, quality provision of quality education uh, constitutes some of the indicators. So the study adopted uh, used secondary data, knowing that this is more reliable than the maybe subjective use of questionnaire and the rest. Right, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sprout. Okay. Uh, and we also in the chat room have a suggestion or an idea from Sarah on uh, okay. possibly using indicators from the UN World Bank of Open Data. And okay, Sarah, World Bank you... Open Data. Yes, I'm not familiar with that. I don't know if uh, Sarah, you want to comment on it? World Bank Open Data. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, the the World Bank has um, this open data website, which is quite uh, impressive because they have data uh, which are at the uh, the unit level is uh, country. Um, and you can pretty much like select a bunch of like different uh, data such as like, uh, you know, um, economic data, demographic data. I'm sure yeah. there might be something that you can either use for constructing an index of corruption or just find directly yeah. that. I never like search for something like that, but I'm sure that there is something you can use. So like the UN World Bank data, uh, it's great website. So just take a look at that. Thank you very much. Can I have your name again so that I can acknowledge you in the final paper? Oh, Sara, Sara Pelligoni. I mean, yes, yeah. <laughs> no need, but if you want, glad to be. Okay, thank you. You're Sarah welcome. Pelligoni. Uh, we, we contact you later for details. Oh, absolutely. So that, if I, so can that help. I acknowledge your contribution in the final paper. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thanks, Sarah, Sarah Pelligoni. All right, I'd like to uh, uh, open it up to discussion of any of the three papers. And, uh, and Kira, I know when Sarah made a comment on uh, uh, relative to emergency management in your topic, I didn't know if you had something you might wanna uh, comment on there. Yes, uh, just yeah. very briefly. Yeah, I, I was. I uh, wanted to notice that it's really interesting how there is this common trend. So I just, uh, mm, brought in the Italian model. So with what is emerging with this civic okay, participation that is being recognized by public administration. But uh, I think that it could be truly uh, seen how also in other fields and in other countries and all around the world, there is this new need for civic participation bottom up in many different fields that uh, somehow needs to be recognized and uh, mm, acknowledged by the, is somehow even supported and facilitated by the public administration and local institutions. So I think that it's, uh, I don't know um, what, uh, what Sarah was saying about the field of emergency because uh, I'm not a, that field, but I think that, uh, again, it's truly a common feature that we can uh, observe and therefore it's, uh, uh, it's truly needed for public administrations and institutions to recognize that. 
and to to be of use simply that yes what, what i recognized uh similar to that in all three is a uh, an increased desire for accountability, uh, whether it's the development districts that Terry discussed or acknowledging citizens' uh, uh, needs and requirements, uh, as Kira discussed, uh, or Dr. Salusu and talking about corruption, the provision of services. All three of those relate to a, a desire for increased accountability. Uh, and, and I think that's a good thing in the public administration arena. Any other questions or comments, observations? I, I enjoyed hearing about the problem of the commons. Uh, I like that Ostrom was mentioned. Um, she developed common pool resource theory, which is uh, something I'm using for other research. It's usually used for environmental studies, but I'm finding that it's applicable to financial management in particular because a resource can be extracted by a group, but it must also be replaced. And so that can also be applicable to fund balances, contingency funds, savings accounts. So I, I liked hearing uh, your perspective on the problem of the commons. Thank you. Good. Yes, well, thank you. Um, in a, especially does the regulation are uh, related to the urban what we call urban commons so all those commons that has uh, as they have been uh, described by the commission rodota in italy that is basically our legal definition of the commons because also this is another big problems with the commons theory that is uh, it comes from the economical um, disciplines while, while we don't have a legally binding definition on, on the commons so in Italy, uh, we developed that uh, definitions and especially the municipal regulation for the shared administration of the commons are related to the urban commons. Uh, so whatever we found in the city and that they can be, as they have been defined, tangible or intangible or, uh, or digital. So this is what the, um, the Italian contribution to the theory of the commons uh, of the Os of Edino Ostrom, we can say, is about if I answered. No, very good, yes. Uh, Dr. Salisu, I, uh, I couldn't help thinking about, and I don't know if you're frozen or not, uh, uh, co the COVID situation and, vaccine, and vaccines and the fact, uh, uh, I know you talk about healthcare in general, but how will uh, corruption affect the distribution of vaccines and the addressing of the COVID issue uh, that came to mind. And again, you're muted, so. No comment, no comment on that or you have frozen, I can't tell, so. Uh, okay, well, we have uh, 10 minutes left, but uh, uh, there's always time to refill your coffee cup uh, <laughs> uh, by going downstairs in your house, if that's where you're at. Uh, if there are no more comments, we'll go ahead and conclude the panel. I want to thank everybody for attending and uh, for your comments, and I want to thank the three presenters. Uh, there's some food for thought there uh, that... Uh, uh, that all of us can investigate or think about further uh, in terms of uh, civic engagement. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.